Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So I'm Wesley Pettit. I work for AWS. Um, I'm Eduardo from ARM. Uh, and uh, we're here to talk about logging um, and with containers in general. Uh, Eduardo here is the creator of a tool called FluentBit. Um, you might have heard of it if you know about FluentD. Um, so we have like five minutes before we're supposed to start. Um, we're going to let everybody come back in the room in case people were planning to watch us. But we thought maybe we'd do like five minutes of Q&A. Um, so I don't know. Uh, tell us your logging questions. Uh, if you know about Fluent Deer, Fluent Bit, this is your time to ask questions. Okay, so it's mostly about what the story behind, behind FluentBit and how do we solve the resource stuff in FluentD. Um, one thing that is really good to explain at the beginning on every, every time is that logging is expensive by nature, right? It's not cheap because we are just not taking bytes and shipping bytes out. We are always doing data processing. And that means serializing data, parsing JSON, which is really expensive. It's cheaper than XML, but it's expensive anyways. In the newer version of FluentD, we have multi-process architecture. So you can say that certain inputs and outputs can uh, be in different workers. So that can take advantage of your multi-architecture CPU system. And on FluentBet, you know, FluentD is written in Ruby and C. FluentBet is just written in C language. And of course, when you do the things in C, you know how to handle the memory. Maybe you know that you can reuse certain buffers and you're not releasing, reallocating, and you can optimize in many areas. And many people, uh, it's switching to FluentBet for performance reason, but also sometimes they are using both. So they put sometimes FluentBet in the nodes, H, H nodes, sorry, and then they aggregate all of the data into FluentD. FluentD, 1,000 plugins, FluentBet, 50. So I think that it's a matter of find your own balance but I think, yeah, you can use both. You can try FluentBet. Both are Apache, Apache license. Both are under the CNCF. So I think that you're going to solve the problem anyways. So. I wanted to add that. So, so AWS has chosen to kind of standardize on FluentBit as our recommendation for open source logging. And that is exactly the reason why we chose it, because it's more efficient. How many of you are using FluentD? If you can raise your hand so you can get a notion. Uh, and FluentBet users? Two, three. Yeah, this is the right audience. <laughs> yeah. OK. It is. Yeah, okay. you have you three, three minutes? Yeah, three minutes. You have more questions now? This is your one shot to talk yeah. about the create. Are you attending KubeCon this week? I have to ask because some people just came to this on day. So in KubeCon, we're going to have a Fluent D sessions and Fluent Bet session, technical sessions. Also, a, as project maintainers, we will we'll be in the sponsor showcase engaging our community. So if you are around, if you see us there, just feel free to reach out or in the receptions with a beer. So if you want to talk about the challenges, because most of the project's roadmaps and new features uh, come from ideas from the end users, like you. So it's really important to have this kind of communication. Yeah. Oh. Vector. Oh, Vector. I think I heard about it. It's like a kind of marketing company. <laughs> yeah, Vector is a project written in Rust. Okay, and I had to make a, a claim there that I think that they are not being very fair in terms of marketing perspective, because if you go to the project website, I think that FluentBit is doing wrong, Vector is doing right. And I think that as an end user, you always can choose uh, your own solution, but I, I vouch that every person should do their own benchmarks. Don't trust in my benchmarks, don't trust on Vector benchmarks or Splunk, 
do your own stuff because your own data pipeline is unique for you. And I think that both projects have different features. Their tests, for example, well, just one example, their tests are based on Keepa Lite connections when sending data to a TCP endpoint. Flow Embed, by default, don't do the Keep Alive connections. They open and close a connection every time. So when you want to have a fair benchmark, you need to have the right setup for both sides. And I think that this is not the case. Um, I want to add, from the AWS point of view, um, this is something that we, we have thought about Vector. Um, in fact, I just published a blog today on the Containers blog. And there's one little blurb in it in which I, I say that, um, so at AWS, we will support any logging tool that our customers want to use. But we do think it is better for there to be standardization on one or two projects. And we think FluentBit and FluentD are those projects. It's better if the community organizes around something and everybody contributes the features that they want, rather than fracture, fra uh, fracturing them into multiple projects. I think, I think now we should start. Yep, okay. but we can talk more about it, so it's free. Also, we have these stuff, this is for right. Well, I think that we just took notes about our names, Twitter handles, and everything. And this session is about FluentBed, uh, open source, and the AWS project in general, so how we are correlating and how AWS is contributing back to the project. And the whole thing of about logging is that we need to process data, right? But data is everywhere. And that's one of the major challenges that we have. Because data by itself is not really important unless you can extract value from your data. You can say you have terabytes of data. But if you don't know how to process your data, how to extract value from it, it's useless. Right? And this applies for application troubleshooting, system services, up to business decisions. So in order to do the data analysis, we said that we need to centralize all the information first in a database, a central place, and then we can extract the value. But what are the challenges that we have? Is that any kind of piece of hardware, like a firewall, or any kind of software, application, services, or the same Linux kernel, generate data, generate events, and information. And we need to centralize all this in one place to perform analysis. But when we start scaling up, we have more places generating more data, and things are not so easy. And this is not like just implement our syslog or just a, log, a, a simple log, logging tool in our system. And how do we solve this? Because in logging, the challenge is that data comes from different channels. It can be the network, TCP, UTP, the file system, systemd, which is another service that manage also logging for the application, it can be sensors if you are in the IoT field. And if you look at common services like Apache Log, MySQL, all of them generate data in a different format. So how do you deal with that? You have data come from multiple places, data comes from different formats, but if you want to do data analysis, you need to centralize all of this. And that's the complexity. If you're using Kubernetes, I think that most of you are using it right now, a simple message like a kubecom it's not just a message, it's also its source of a stream, it's also the timestamp, the time when this message was generated. And after that, we are missing the context. And one message like this in Kubernetes also is missing the parts, where are the labels, where are the annotations, what's the pod name, container name, and so on. So a simple message in Kubernetes becomes something like this. So now you realize that besides to have the applications that generate data from different places in different formats, you have to deal with context. And that's why you need to have specialized tools that can deal with these kind of scenarios. And FluentBed is one of them. There are many tools in the market. Uh, some of them are open source or closed source. And I think that, uh, as Vasil said, it's mostly up to you to decide what to do, what to implement in your own environment, but always be careful about license and who's behind the project. It's not the same to have just one project where you have just one company than where you have a community. And a community is not just uh, 10, you know, 10 guys writing code. Communities sometimes are companies. 
So behind Fluentd, we said recently that Fluentd has like a thousand plugins. And I'm sure that when we started Fluentd, not my, my colleagues, they started like 10 or 15 plugins mostly. But all of the others has been written by the community. In community, I mean companies that needed to create a different connector, a different filter for the project and made it available under the same license in internet, and that's what people is using. Fluentbed is like a sub-project of Fluentd and also is part of the CNCF. Fluentbed started on 2015, originally to solve the login problems for embedded Linux. We had this Fluentd, but we forecast that Fluentd will not be a good fit for embedded Linux because it was designed for servers, that we assume that we have certain capacity and CPU and memory. But quickly, people from the cloud space who was playing with containers said, hey, I like Fluentbit. I need something like that. Would you please add features A, B, and C? Would you please add a Kubernetes filter? Would you please add blah, blah, blah? And well, here's where we are now. After a couple of years, I think that Fluentbit growth is crazy. It's fully it's Apache license, and on a daily basis, we get like almost 300,000 deployments every day, 300,000. That means that every day where we have Kubernetes cluster where are spinning up new VMs or new nodes are using either Fluentd or Fluentbed. So, and this also comes with a huge responsibility. So every commit, every change that we merge is going to be spread you know, across thousands of clusters. Uh, Fluentbit is written in C language. Yeah, C, it's not C++, C language, and styled for low CPU and memory consumption. And it's barely a copy of Fluentd. We, just, we took the best thing of Fluentd in terms of design architecture and re-implemented with some improvements for the new challenges of embedded and also the cloud. So that's why we have a pluggable architecture. That means that we can implement connectors to com consume and get data from different sources, plugins to write to enrich data with metadata, or also output connectors to send data to different places like Elastic, InfluxDB, Wesley wrote the, the connector for AWS, and so on. So companies contribute back to the project, but the project is, a, is also a strong backbone that allows you to solve all the login challenges. And we call this like a, like a data pipeline which is basically we have an input where we collect data from. All of this can be implemented as plugins. We have a parser because data comes in different formats. We need to convert unstructured data to a binary representation. So we need to parse the data. We have filters. Filters because maybe you want to drop data. You don't want to have all your records. Maybe certain records that has a pattern. Maybe you want to enrich your logs with metadata, like the Kubernetes context, we buffer the data, either in memory or the file system, because you don't want to lose it. And then we ship the data out to your database or any kind of service that you're running where you are aggregating your own log information. Uh, one application in technical terms is like generate a record. That record has two things as a minimum, the timestamp and the message. But internally, we handle all this in a binary format. And I think that that's one of the major difference with other, tool, other tools, because we take the input of data, it doesn't matter if it's JSON or a raw text, and we create a binary representation of that data with message pack. Message pack is like a binary JSON. And in this case, Fluentbed or Fluentd can accomplish that, handle all these kind of binary messages. The data that comes into the pipeline, if you look at the, the boxes on the left, they are grouped by tags. And we group them by tags because then we can use the tags and create rules to ship this data out to any kind of output connector. Not just one database, because people say, hey, I want to have my data in Elasticsearch, but I want also to send it to Amazon S3. So how do I do that? So in the whole pipeline, you can configure that with tags and uh, matches. And of course, we have the storage phase, which is for buffering. This information is a bit outdated because the stats already grow the last weeks. And we have a wide adoption, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Datadog is also now contributing back to the project. 
If you get Flow Embed, you're going to get your own Datadog connector, so you can create your fancy, fancy dashboard with metrics or AWS services. In the Kubernetes context, uh, if you don't know how it works, Kubernetes is like you have a master API server and you have the nodes. So how do you deal with all of this? We, what we do is to deploy Flow Embed as a daemon set. A daemon set is a pod that runs on every node and then we start collecting all the log containers for every pod, for every container that is running. After that, we go to the master API server and get the metadata for those specific logs. This is what I mean with context. After that, we can ship the data out to our specialized service or database. So there's no scenario where you can think that you can accomplish this manually. You need a specialized tool for this. And now I'm going to pass it on to Wesley, who's going to talk about his work with this integration. Hello. Yay, now we have that lovely echo. Um, yeah, so, okay, so. Um, I work for Container Services. Uh, I'm on the service team, an engineer. And about a year ago, I was a Fluent D user, and uh, we were thinking about like improving Fluent D for our customers, recommending it more for our customers. Um, and then I started to look, and I I went like, well, wait a second. If if you're all using Kubernetes, I mean, sorry, if you're all using Fluent D for your logging. Uh, how much of the CPU and memory on each node is actually being taken up just for your logging? And uh, so I started to do some performance tests, and like, wow, it's pretty substantial, and I started reading, and I heard from other people who said basically complained about the same thing, that, you know, like, okay, now I'm running this daemon set on every single node, and like 25% of the memory is being used just for taking up my logs, um, which is kind of insane. Um, so then a coworker of mine uh, showed me Fluent Bit, and that started the story of AWS 4 Fluent Bit. Um, so then uh, we decided to, to integrate with Fluent Bit. So at that time, Fluent Bit didn't have any support for sending logs to AWS services. Um, so we built a number of plugins. Um, so I built a CloudWatch Logs plugin, a Kinesis Data Firehose plugin. Uh, one of my coworkers built a Kinesis Data Streams plugin, which will be uh, released fairly soon. Um, and then we packaged it all together in what we call the AWS 4 Fluent Bit image. Um, I wanted originally to call it the Fluent Bit 4 AWS image, because that's what it was supposed to be. It's Fluent Bit for your AWS logs. But for some marketing and legal reasons, the AWS part has to come first. So hence, it got flipped to be AWS 4 Fluent Bit. Um, I don't know how to use that thing. I'm just going to use the computer. Um, so yeah, so this is why did we choose Fluent Bit? This is some performance tests, tests that I did myself. Um, the results are a little bit different than other performance tests that you might see. But all of them tell basically the same story, um, which is that Fluent D has, you know, somewhere almost an order of magnitude more CPU and memory usage, um, anywhere from double to five or six or seven times as much memory usage, depending upon exactly which test you do and which, you know, which plugins you look at. Um, this specifically looks at uh, the Fluent Bit plugin that I wrote for Kinesis Firehose, which is written in Golang, actually. So we write our plugins right now uh, in Golang, and then you can compile it to interop with C using CGO. Um, and so that's how, how it works. If you don't use the direct AWS integration, um, like let's say you're just sending directly to an Elasticsearch cluster, that uses a native Fluent Bit plugin written in C, and that the performance is even better. Um, so these tests specifically are, this is like the performance of our plugins, which aren't even the best that Fluent Bit can offer in terms of uh, low resource usage. Um, so, okay, so the AWS for Fluent Bit image, it's on Docker Hub, um, but um, we figured that wasn't the best option for our customers, so we put 
uh, regional Amazon ECR uh, image links. So we have, uh, in, this, in this table, I'm only showing three because that was all that would fit in the slide, but we have one in basically every single AWS region, uh, even AWS GovCloud. Um, there is a local image which you can use in that region. Any AWS customer can pull this image. Um, you just need valid credentials for your account, and basically any account is whitelisted to pull that image. Um, we have these documented um, in our documentation. Uh, and basically, you know, that, that lets you save on data transfer toss, costs. They're highly available. Pull them easily. Um, we're working on ways to make that, uh, that, you see that image URL right there, which just is like an account ID. We're working on ways to make that a little bit less sketchy so that um, it's just like, I want AWS for Fluent Bit, and you just get that. Um, so look for an announcement on that closer towards reInvent. And that's all I can say for now. Because um, it's, it's only mid-November. There are like two more weeks till reInvent. Um, so I also want to mention one more thing. Um, raise your hand if for some reason, I think I'm going to get no hands here, but does anybody or your company also use Amazon ECS? Raise your hand. OK, a few of you. Awesome. That's, that's exciting for me because um, so I don't actually work personally on Kubernetes very much. I actually mostly work on uh, supporting ECS logging. Um, and we created something called FireLens, uh, which is our fancy name for a managed experience that makes it easy to use Fluentd and FluentBit. Uh, so if you or your coworkers are Amazon ECS users, tell them to go check that out. Um, we've written a bunch of blogs on it, a bunch of tutorials. It basically is just our way of trying to make it easier to use FluentBit um, besides just, so AWS for FluentBit is, you know, use FluentBit to send logs to AWS services. This is make it easier to orchestrate FluentBit. Um, so the most important thing that I want, want you to take away from uh, ta today's talk is that, uh, so AWS is committed to expanding our like, kind of open source reach and logging. We want to make this experience better. Uh, we want to make it easier to you know, send your logs to all sorts of different destinations, both in AWS and also you know, like partner logging services, um, like for instance, Datadog, which we worked with to um, have them contribute to FluentBit. Uh, and I am specifically right now working on figuring out uh, how we're going to take AWS flu for FluentBit forward in the next year. So if you would go to our GitHub, oh, I see we're losing that screen. Oh, well. Um, so the, the GitHub link is AWS slash AWS for FluentBit. Go on there, um, open issues for any new plugins or integrations you want to see, um, or go to our AWS slash containers roadmap GitHub, open issues there. Uh, we're open to really looking at anything. Uh, Basically, like, like we're working on figuring out what do we want to even do right now. Uh, so this is the time. Ideas that you propose are much more likely for us to look at them if you do it in the next three months than if you do it in six months. We always look for any customer feedback, but right now is the time. Seize the opportunity. Um, also, you can just tweet at me. Um, I have been largely the lead engineer behind a lot of our integrations with FluentBit and FluentD. So you can tweet at me, and then I'll, you know, I'll categorize the feedback and whatnot. Um, my Twitter handle is there. Um, also, I want to mention that we have and will be publishing various FluentD and FluentBit tutorials on our different blogs. Um, there was one published on the Containers blog today. Um, there's one publishing on the Open Source blog later this week, which I know about because I wrote them. Um, but anyway, there are also things written by other people. You should read all of that. Um, there's some great tutorials on AWS logging. Um, so, and I want to now specifically talk about one of them. This was written mostly by Michael, who I don't see right now, but he was one of the people who came up on stage with Ignacio this morning, beginning he's uh, uh, our CNCF ambassador. Anyway, um, so this is a tutorial on using FluentBit with Amazon EKS. Uh, it's a very basic tutorial, um, but it gets you up and running. Um, and I want to specifically show 
one of the things that you can do uh, if you follow this tutorial. So um, what the tutorial will do is it will have you, ah. all right, so here we got my terminal up here. So have you set up um, a EKS cluster and then have you deploy uh, Flint bit to it. So here the shows I got Flint bit and I've got Nginx pods running there. Um, and then I can go and let me get the logs for Fluent Bit just to prove that I am actually running this demo. It's not smoke and mirrors. Um, Fluent Bit is running, and so I'm using it to send to Kinesis Firehose, and Kinesis Firehose can send to Amazon S3, which is kind of like a nice, cheap way to store your logs. Um, you can just send a bunch of data in S3 and have it sit there. Um, and then you can use an Amazon product called Athena to write SQL queries to query over uh, the logs in S3. So this shows here creating a SQL table uh, for our Nginx logs. And then I can search the, oh wait, no, that's the wrong, sorry, wrong query. I can search the Nginx logs. So this is um, looking at the top IPs that are calling my Nginx service. Um, so let that run for a second, assuming I have internet, and then we'll get back results. If not, we'll give up. Let's see. Um, I've had this demo, so uh, we launched AWS for Fluent Bit back in July at the AWS New York Summit, and I did a Twitch session uh, on Fluent Bit and AWS and this is the same demo as I ran back then. So it's been running for, what, like four or five months now. So there are a lot of logs in there. Um, but so it just searched over several months of logs and found that these IPs are the ones that are made 18,000 requests, apparently. Uh, I think I wrote a script that just sits there and calls Nginx. It's been sitting there for months. So, um, But anyway, uh, that is AWS Influent Bit. I'm going to turn it back over to Eduardo for how many minutes? We've got 10 whole minutes. Really? So you can talk about. Uh, but it's can... okay if you cut. No what? worries. We have other presenters also looking for some time. So. I okay. Mean... <laughs> how much time can we have? Okay. You can have five more minutes. It's okay. Five more minutes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Five more minutes. Where do you have the slides yeah. here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well. One of the um, people always ask is about the roadmap of the project. I think that for Embed at the beginning was a uh, roadmap was quite of closed because we always say that sometimes we need to prioritize certain things for certain customers and so on. But since the project was adopted widely and we have more open communications with companies and so on, we have this roadmap uh, in public and everything is under a different governance now. So uh, for January 2020, we're going to get, thank you, this uh, new features of config maps. Config maps basically is a way to avoid that you as an user can mess up your own configuration. So it's very easily when you deploy services to have a typo and you don't know why things are not working. With config maps, we are going to make sure that your configuration looks right, otherwise it will not work. I will let you know, hey, this is wrong. This is a typo, and these are the options that are available, or this is not the right, right data type. Uh, we got a lot of requirements to support a lot of in data encoding, which is not UTF-8, like Latin characters and so on. So we are working hard on that. And I don't know if you are here about, but we have a new stream processor. Uh, Fluentbit is more than just logging. We started logging, like collecting data, shipping data, then applying filtering to do some data modification. And now we implement a stream processor where you can run SQL queries on top of your data pipeline in Fluentbit. There's no database, there's no table, there's no indexing. And why this is useful? Because you can select data using SQL with special patterns, create new uh, data workflows, and create alerts, or any kind of fancy thing running your own SQL queries. And of course, with that, you can implement your own machine learning algorithms on queries, time forecasting, and so on. And of course, performance improvements. We are always looking for how to optimize memory and be able to process more records. Do we have more time, or? I think we have like two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to, the, uh, for this stream processor stuff, I think that, uh, oh, I'm going to show just two slides, like as a bonus track. Usually when you process, you, you can have two sites, the edge and the cloud, okay? The edge can be anything. But for these kind of cases, when people do stream processing or run SQL queries, they usually do this in the cloud. And that is fine because that is one option. But sometimes that, um, the cons is that you have some penalty in time. You have some latency, right? You have to wait a couple of seconds and sometimes things are not uh, processed right away because you are aggregating thousands of records. So we said if you are collecting the data on the edge, we have all this stream processor, why we cannot mix the concepts together in the edge? So what we did was move all this new stream processor engine into Flow Embed, and now we allow that you can do your own data analysis on the edge, in your node, in your embedded environment, before to ship the data out to the cloud. Of course, this is quite optional. Maybe the results of your stream processor are going to AWS or your own database anyways. But here, the processing is happening in the order of milliseconds. Not in seconds, not in minutes. And that's one of the advantage with this uh, kind of implementations. And if you are interested on this, we're going to have a session of FluentBet and stream processing this week. It's on Wednesday. And if you want to learn more about FluentD, also the session is on Tuesday. Okay. I think that that is, that is for now. Is that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.